aromatic snail, literally every other manufacturer. There's a chip shortage. Apple puts an SOC into the monitor just for the webcam. It's true. It's damn true. And despite being a two and a half year old SOC, that monitor still has better perf uh, single core and competitive multi-core than the latest generation Snapdragon 8 Series 1. So go figure. And you know what, in a weird way, I think that's Apple's version of a chip shortage or a chip constraint. Not that they don't have all the silicon, they're obviously shipping it where two years later, we're still waiting on big Nvidia and AMD cards and PlayStation 5s, but they don't have the capacity, the time, the resources, the bandwidth to make a dedicated chip for every device. So they have to make chips that can serve the widest range of devices possible. So even if, you know, the studio display doesn't require everything, almost anything an A13 has, or the iPad Air isn't making use of the full Thunderbolt capacity or the 16 gigabytes of RAM, potential for 16 gigabytes of RAM, or a lot of the other features that M1 can provide, that it requires specific things that are specific to those chips, but it's more efficient in terms of time and resources and money for Apple to just take the A13 or make way more, like make it rain M1 chips and put that in everything that requires those specific capabilities than it is to make custom silicon with only those specific capabilities for each and every device. It is the single biggest advantage they've always had over merchant silicon providers. And if anything, not using every single transistor, not maximizing the potential of every SOC in every device is the only downside to that approach. We just right now today hit over 400 videos on this channel over 315,000 subscribers and over 46 million views. When I quit my big media job back in March of 2020, I never, not in my wildest dreams, imagined we could build this new indie channel up so quickly and so together, especially not during the last couple of multi years of madness. So thank you, sincerely, thank you for liking, subscribing, watching, commenting, supporting, and most of all, just continuing to ask me all of these questions so always. Now. Grab a beverage, maybe a snack, and let's do this. Basically, everybody, why is the M1 Studio Ultra two pounds heavier than the M1 Studio Max? I mean, it, it basically answers itself. The M1 Ultra is literally two M1 Maxes, which means it needs twice the thermal dissipation capabilities, twice the, the piping, the heat sinks, all of that, and he's double what the M1 Max does, and that don't weigh nothing. Gordon Tyler on Patreon, and as always, supporters over at patreon.com slash Renee Ritchie get Q&A priority. Is the new 27 inch studio display, the mini LED display that we've been waiting for, or is there one more thing coming to rule them all? And no, the new studio display is not mini LED. It is traditional LED. The mini LED version is still coming and might just be the replacement for the current Pro Display XDR. So significantly higher resolution and image quality, but also likely significantly higher price. Sislisi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If not, please correct me. I was waiting for Mac mini with M1 Pro. When do you think that'll be introduced? And there's actually conflicting rumors about that right now. Some people believe it'll be as soon as WWDC with an M1 Pro. Others believe it'll be later this fall with an M2 Pro, maybe the first M2 Pro. So as of right now, I would still hold to hope, but I also wouldn't expect it until you see it. T-Flight, when might we see a replacement for the old MacBook? Nothing, executive, the manager book. My guess is we won't see a direct replacement for it, but rather, the rumors that we've been hearing about the next generation MacBook Air, the one with the redesign with the much smaller bezels, but similar size display, that would probably fit into an enclosure not too different in size from the 12 inch MacBook. And there are also rumors that Apple is considering dropping the Air name. So we'll go back to the much simpler MacBook at the entry slash premium portable end of the spectrum, and then still the MacBook Pro at the more expensive Pro higher end. Damien Men, will it be possible to connect consoles or other computers to the studio display or is it Mac only? So it's not literally Mac only, but it's pretty much Mac only in that you can connect PCs to it. You can connect anything that connects via Thunderbolt, uh, the DisplayPort capabilities in a Thunderbolt cable to the studio display, but almost all of the amenities, almost all of the Apple specific reasons to have it are dependent on Apple hardware. Basically anything that communicates with the A13 Bionic chipset in the display requires a Mac to do that communication. So it's everything from True Tone 
to a lot of the audio and webcam uh, capabilities of the display. So if you don't have a Mac, I would recommend you look at something from LG or Samsung instead. If you do have a Mac, but we're hoping to multi-purpose it with other consoles or computers, then I would look at it as something like a bare panel without any functionality beyond that. Robin Harley, how does the studio display stack up against the 5K display on the outgoing iMac? Will the regular M1 Mac mini do the studio display justice? And second question first, yes, absolutely. The M1 Mac mini can drive up to a Pro Display XDR. So it'll be fine with the studio display. As to how it compares with the 27 inch iMac panel, as far as I can tell, just on paper, they're identical. They're just LCD, LED backlit displays, P3 wide color gamut with a nano texture option if you so choose, which is yes, a panel that's been on the consumer market for years and years and years and years now, but it's still one of the best panels in the consumer market. Rohan Bade, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right again. If not, please correct me. What would be the rumored logic for the MacBook Air refresh to ship with the same and two year old at shipping M1 chip? And that's a recent rumor going around that instead of the next generation MacBook or MacBook Air, debuting with an M2 chipset, it'll debut with an M1. I think that was from uh, Guomingchi recently. And really it could go either way, just because Apple has announced an M1 Ultra doesn't mean they won't continue to ship devices, maybe even new devices with M1 chips. We just saw the iPad Air get an M1 chip at the same event. But for me personally, I do hope we see it with M2 because I wanna see Apple pushing things forward. I don't want Intel to start you know, cracking wise about how long it takes Apple to spec bump, to generationally revise their chipsets. And also as time goes on, M1 is based on A14 architecture. We're already at A15 and come this fall, we'll be at A16. And while I don't expect the Mac to keep pace, absolute pace with the iPhone, I don't want it falling behind in terms of efficiency, performance, or feature sets either. Arthur Kawa, how conceivable is it that they have a four or more die ultra extended CPU for the next M2 product? And I do think we've seen now what Apple is doing in terms of multi-die fusion technology. And I think that is only gonna continue to escalate the same way their generation over generation technology has escalated for the last you know, decade plus and how their extensions of core architectures has escalated over the last 18 months to two years. So seeing something with four dies, six dies, eight dies in the future wouldn't surprise me at all. Whether that's with M2 or M3, we're gonna to have to wait and see, but I expect if we sit by the river long enough, the body of all of that silicon is gonna float by us. John Malkin. Will Mac Pro have internal expandability? What type of expansion cards or modules would make sense? Yeah, I certainly hope so. I think, well, two reasons. One, the Mac Studio shows us what Apple is doing with the closed appliance form factor, the original Mac mini form factor, the 2013 Mac Pro trash can form factor. That idea has sort of its ultimate expression right now in the Mac Studio, but that does still leave room for something else, something more, something on top of it something like the traditional cheese grater. And I think Apple wouldn't have invested so much time and effort into the 2019 Mac Pro if they didn't mean to push those technologies forward. I mean, for such a small niche product, that is just a ton of resources to put in for a one-off. So my expectation is we will see something that is larger and more modular to the extent that it can be. And maybe it'll take a couple generations for things like off-package RAM, uh, and maybe expandable graphics options. For now, I think what we'll see is just the PCIe slot. So for example, if you wanted to put a RAID controller in there, I think there's a lot of really basic things that still make sense that aren't involved in the, the core system on a chip architecture that Apple's gonna be using for the Mac going forward. Origosis on Twitter, will Triple Studio Display figure out the audio and make the audio experience that much better? My guess is no. My guess is that each studio display will present itself as a separate device that you can select to send audio or pull webcam video from, but that there won't be any fused uh, experience available. And that I think is a bit of a missed opportunity on Apple's part, to be frank, because there is an A13 Bionic in there. And we've seen with you know much less capable A8 or uh, S5 based HomePods that Apple can do these studio pairing things and being able to pair a couple of studio displays into a larger soundstage would be awesome. And even just the way it works with other Apple products, basically one of my hopes and dreams for a display with Apple Silicon, dedicated Apple Silicon inside it, was that if you needed to, if you wanted to, you could just 
plop down your MacBook and connect to it wirelessly with a close to zero latency connection like you do with an iPad on Sidecar. I mean, if, of course, there's huge advantages, Matrix and Battlestar Galactica style advantages to a hard line, and most people wanna use that most of the time. But just being able to do it wirelessly, that to me, again, is exactly the kind of differentiation I've come to expect from Apple. And I hope it's something they're considering for the future of studio display and studio display type products. Emily D. Baker, the streaming lawyer, did Apple kill the 27 inch iMac? It's not on the site. Is the Mac Studio and Studio Display the replacement? Kill, maybe, uh, put in suspended animation, also maybe. I think Apple is at the very least testing or decided internally that the Mac Studio and 27 inch Studio Display will be the current replacement for a larger iMac, a 27 inch iMac. Whether that remains to be true, I mean, Apple can and does change their minds sometimes. I know a lot of people really like the all-in-one and really want a bigger all-in-one than the 24-inch iMac. So I would hold to hope, but maybe not anytime soon. And I do think there are real advantages to having the compute cores separate from the display, especially because the technology in both is improving so rapidly that being able to update one or the other at your convenience is an advantage over being in that locked sometimes into that all-in-one form factor. Anonymity yours, is there a single reason left to buy the Mac Pro? And no, there is no single reason left to buy the Mac Pro. There are a few reasons, a couple of reasons though. One is that it's still on Intel, it's still on x86, which means it can still run bootcamp which gives you access to a bunch of Windows apps that just aren't available on the Mac, especially in the higher end studio market. Also, big production houses are notoriously not quick to always port over their in-house apps, the stuff that they use internally. That can take a while and those might still be bound to x86 and not perform as well under Rosetta because they are so specific to those industries. And then just the massive amounts of resources that you can bring to bear inside that Mac Pro enclosure just the, the sheer quantity of cores, of graphics core cards, PCIe expansion slots of memory. We just have 128 gigabytes as of now on Apple Silicon, but there's 1.5 terabytes of RAM, 1.5 terabytes of RAM available in the Mac Pro enclosure. And for some very high end production work, you want basically all the RAM you can possibly get and then some. So yeah, several reasons still to get it if you absolutely need it. But I think pretty much everyone at this point is anxiously awaiting the Apple Silicon version. Ben asks, how does the new Apple monitor compare to the LG Ultrafine 5K Apple has been selling from a picture quality standpoint? My understanding just based on the paperwork is that they should be identical. I would not be surprised at all if LG is supplying the 5K uh, panels for these displays because that's traditionally been the way it works. LG would make a panel for the iMac and then the same exact panel would go into the cinema display, LED display, Thunderbolt display version of, of that iMac. And my guess and at this point, yes, still 100% a guess, is that if you took the previous 27 inch iMac or the 5K ultra fine LG display, if you took those panels out and put them in an Apple enclosure, you would effectively have the studio display. Just with way, way, way better manufacturing, build quality and features. Matt Calloway, what is the A13 chip in the studio display actually used for? So my understanding is that in the studio display, the A13 Bionic is doing like the image signal processing for the webcam, uh, maybe helping accelerate into real time all the panning and scanning and zooming in and out for center stage, which is what lets multiple people enter or exit the frame while keeping you, you know, right smack dab in the middle of that frame. Also the audio signal processing for the spatial audio, the Dolby Atmos, so it can create those wide 3D sound stages, and then just some internal stuff for the feature sets that are supported currently by the display and maybe some that will still be to come. And my guess is that the A13 was picked specifically for that audio and video support. The Apple TV, for example, the current Apple TV 4K only, quote unquote, only has an A12 Bionic in it, but it doesn't have things like a webcam or a speaker system it has to support. That chipset, the A12, was chosen specifically to support 4K60 video. Apple doesn't really think about which chipset generation, which latest and greatest, what number any of these things are. They pick a set of capabilities that they need to deliver for a product and then figure out which chipset, what silicon, what hardware in general 
can deliver those capabilities. Matsoft, do you know if the M1 Max in the studio is clocked higher, has better performance than the MacBook Pro? My guess is that it'll be clocked the same, if not ever so slightly higher. But the big difference is the thermal management system, the fans basically, because in the MacBook, even though the CPUs aren't constrained, they can pretty much run under full load forever. When you start lighting up the rest of the silicon, the rendering engines, especially those massive GPUs, it does start to become thermally constrained. But in the Mac Studio enclosure, I don't know if that's gonna be the case. Like I think you'll be able to run that thing flat out, be able to sustain heavy workloads for a really, really long time. I don't know if it's gonna be forever perpetual. We'll have to wait and see when people put it under really heavy loads for really long periods of time. My guess is that it will still downclock slightly, but nowhere nearly what it does in a MacBook Pro. That's the whole advantage of having a much bigger, much better cool desktop system like the Studio. Chris Palmer, will the Studio Display Visa mount be available for future conversions? Is it user swappable? And no, surprisingly, even flabbergastingly, uh, it is not. You have to pick which mount you want when you order the display and they are not user changeable. James Holt, I just wanna know if I can use one, both of my older iMacs as the monitors for the new Mac Studio. And alas, no, because when Apple went uh, to 5K with the iMac, they started making their own custom timing controllers, TCONs, in order to basically stitch two streams together to make that much larger at the time display. And they've persisted, they've kept doing their custom TCON since then. And the cost of doing it that way was that they could no longer support uh, target display mode, which is what you used to be able to use to make any iMac into, you know, basically a standalone display. And that has never come back. Apple has never re-enabled that. So there's no way to just plug a Mac Studio into an iMac and use the iMac as a display. You would be able to airplay to it, but uh, I wouldn't trust that sort of connection uh, for anything other than video streaming. It's just, it's just not intended to be and is not as good as a cable for a persistent desktop environment. George Lim, is the standard Mac mini still safe to buy? And yes, if you don't care that it hasn't been redesigned, if you're fine with the enclosure, and M1 provides the capabilities that you need to do the job that you have to get done, like it can power the workloads that you need to get through, then yeah, it's fine. I do think you wanna be cautious though, because it's been 18 months since the M1 Mac mini was announced. And I would just guess that the M2 Mac mini can't be too far behind. So if you can wait, my always advice remains, wait as long as you absolutely can before you upgrade and then upgrade only when you have to buy the best thing you possibly can and then enjoy the hell out of it because there will always be something new and something next. So have zero regrets and to get more, just way more out of all of this and maybe even get involved in making the next generation of this Check out the algorithms, neural networks, and machine learning courses on today's sponsor, Brilliant. Basically, everything that the next generation of everything from silicon to software is going to be built on, but also math, science, and computer science, physics, quantum mechanics, game theory, so much more. Because Brilliant is the online, interactive STEM learning platform with a growing catalog of courses specifically crafted to help you learn concepts by working through them yourself in visual, hands-on ways. And all the lessons are thoughtfully broken up into bite-sized pieces so you can learn at your own pace, no pressure. Like, have you ever wanted to learn code, but you were put off by overly complicated traditional computer programming courses? Well, Brilliant has actual fun, interactive challenges that let you shift blocks of pseudocode around, receive immediate feedback and get results. You feel like you're solving puzzles, gaming even, but the whole entire time you're learning how algorithms work. And once you know that, coding becomes way less intimidating and way more accessible. There's also a brand new everyday math course that provides even more foundational math lessons to help even more people get started. Because here's the thing, Everyone, absolutely everyone starts somewhere and you can get started right now, today, for free. Just visit brilliant.org slash Renee or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So click that button on the screen or go to brilliant.org slash Renee Clicking on that button really helps out this channel and so does hitting up this playlist for even more Apple event coverage, all the details, all the inside info, all for you. So hit up this playlist and I'll see you in the next video.